Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the last of the SVC speaker series for 2017. It may be the last, but it's certainly going to be the best. We're very lucky to have Mr. Rob Walsh with us today. Rob has a long and illustrious career in public service and economic development. Most recently, he served as executive director of the Help USA Fund dedicated to addressing the needs of the homeless. He was a distinguished lecturer and faculty director of the Executive Masters of Public Administration program at Baruch College and currently serves as an adjunct professor at Columbia University. Rob also hosts The Bottom Line for Small Business, a radio program on 1010 Winds, which can be heard every Monday and Friday at 8.56 a.m. and 5.56 p.m., so set your clocks. Among his earlier professional undertakings, Rob was president of Charlotte Center City Partners in North Carolina, executive director of Union Square Partnership in New York, and executive director of the New York City Urban Fellows Program. He holds a master's degree from Fordham University in public policy analysis and a degree from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. But Rob's here today to share his experiences in the Bloomberg administration as commissioner of the Small Business Service for New York. Between 2002 and 2014, he oversaw this economic development agency with a budget of $124 million and a staff of 275 employees. Rob was responsible for reshaping the agency to focus on and be more responsive to the city's 200,000 small businesses. Among his major achievements in this position, Rob created 25 new business improvement districts and established seven business solution centers where he secured more than 200 million in capital for small businesses. Rob led business recovery initiatives following Hurricane Sandy, overseeing efforts to disperse more than $20 million for businesses in impacted areas. He focused on improving the city's minority and women-owned business program, increasing certification from 700 to nearly 4,000 participants. In many ways, Rob was totally instrumental in the economic growth of New York City through the Bloomberg administration. Rob will share with us some of his experiences and some of his secrets for business success, which hopefully will serve you well when building your own business. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Rob Walsh to Stevens. Wow, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, and thanks for coming out on, on such a cold, cold night uh, here. I was chatting on the side. I don't know if you know my relationship with the guy who's been building up this campus and doing a tremendous job. Uh, Bob Mafia and I go back, it's hard to believe, 45 years ago. I, I don't know what you were doing 45 years ago, but he and I were in a playground uh, playing ball uh, together in Brooklyn. Um, and it was, it's been nice. This is my first time on the campus and I appreciate the tour of the Venture Center and meeting some of the unbelievable uh, entrepreneurs that you're nurturing, building, uh, creating here. Uh, I understand why uh, Stevens is called uh, the University of Innovation now. My uh, talk tonight is going to be focused on my work with Mayor Bloomberg. Um, I started with um, Mike Bloomberg in January of 2002. And it's, it's a little bit of a lesson of um, uh, career, I'll give you a little bit of career advice. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time, and I was with the mayor of Charlotte, and we were talking about where we were going to be putting the NBA arena. They had gotten the Hornets back. And I got a call out of the blue from Mike Bloomberg, who was building his team. And he asked me if I would be interested in this new agency that he was going to be putting together that was going to focus on small business. And the next thing I knew, I was on a flight the next morning, the first flight out to New York at 6 o'clock in the morning after being up all night because my wife uh, was a little upset about the possibility of moving. She worked for the North Carolina Dance Theater. We just bought a house. We renovated the house. Um, you, could, you could imagine, right? And um, 59 minutes into the interview, he um, got up, put his hand out, and said, say yes. And I 
I had a contract with the organization that I was working with on the revitalization of downtown Charlotte, but I couldn't resist um, this urge, this powerful pull to, to, to come back uh, to this great city that every day you look out the window and, and, and see. And putting my slides together, I, I was thinking uh, tonight, uh, what is so emblematic about the growth of, um, of New York City? And what would represent small businesses in a, uh, in a way that, um, that I could share with you? And I thought of Shake Shack. How many people have been to a Shake Shack? Right, almost everybody. Is there a Shake Shack here in, in, in Hoboken yet? No. Not, not yet, uh, the, it'll, it'll be here. And I think of the story of Shake Shack and I think of the story of Danny Meyer, uh, one of the great entrepreneurs of, of this uh, country, quite frankly. The story goes that Shake Shack, believe it or not, began with, as a hot dog vendor. They, they put a hot dog stand out there because they wanted to generate activity into the park. And it was part of a public art fund to raise money for the park. And uh, after three years, they convinced the Parks Department to build a fixture in Madison Square Park. And the rest is history. It is now a international fixture. And it's a great example of a good idea, and this is what we're talking about tonight, is good ideas and taking a good idea and growing it and, and building it and making something happen and this is as Small Business Services Commissioner for uh, an unbelievable mayor in Mike Bloomberg. I got an opportunity to meet many of entrepreneurs like Danny Meyer and growing many small businesses. But when I started um, in New York and coming back to New York from Charlotte, it was the aftermath of September 11, 2001. It's hard to believe 16 years ago, and we were nine weeks in. If you think about it, Mike Bloomberg had taken office. Fires, quite frankly, were still smoldering at, at the World Trade Center, and the city was aching physically, emotionally, and financially. And when you, you look at that beautiful skyline that we can see out the window, you wonder today, in fact, experts questioned whether the city would still be feasible the way it was. Many said the city's economy would never rebound. Even the Federal Reserve Board came out with a paper that encouraged, encouraged banks, anchor institutions where most of the jobs were, to disperse their jobs, remember? I mean, that's what it was. They were, telling, they were telling banks disperse for security reasons. The city will never be the same. The mayor was defiant, and he said New York was going to be open for business. But this is what it looked like. In downtown Manhattan, in the lower Manhattan area around World Trade Center, more than 18,000 small businesses were impacted. Let me read you some numbers from that time. We had great losses, including over 430,000 jobs and $2.8 million in wages. Many struggles to stay afloat. The vacancy rates around the World Trade Center were at 40% and above. This was, this was tough times. A picture of Times Square that you don't often see. Empty streets. Tourism, one of our key sectors after the financial sectors, plummeted. It was easy to get a hotel room in New York, that's for sure. It plummeted by over 50%. And the city faced very difficult times. Um, a $5 billion deficit um, the New York Times had a front page article that, that, ha that painted a very gloomy picture. The no November 11th edition of the New York Times, where it said that this would lead to an austerity budget, dirtier streets, higher crime, and an exodus of people and businesses. Now, I put this slide up there to have some fun, because not only did we have a budget problem, 
and we had a lot of experts talking about gloomy, gloomy times, dirtier streets, higher crime. But we had an aging infrastructure of a subway. Some things haven't changed. I love this one. I, 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 I took a picture of this one. Think about that, right? Do you, do you really want to be on that L train to Brooklyn? <laughs> Could someone figure that out for me? 1,534 minutes? How long are you going to have to wait for that sub subway, right? But we still have difficult, obsolete infrastructures that we have to overcome. And we had an economy heavily, heavily, heavily concentrated on Wall Street, as you, as you can see. In my opinion, when you start talking about economic development in New York City, I think one of the great failures in New York was previous administrations. Either they didn't have the resources, or they didn't have that drive what we were talking about, about Mike Bloomberg, of setting forward a comprehensive strategic plan to move the city and having a development, and it had not taken place in decades. And you, could, you think about the engineer, that engineer in Mike Bloomberg. Got to have a plan. Got to have a blueprint. We got to have something that we're going to move forward. And without a, with very few exceptions, New York City had not seen major developments in decades. Patching things together, but you think about waterfront developments along the East River, along, along the West Side, the Brooklyn side, Bronx, Queens. You had a lot of empty buildings scattered about, decrepit, empty, industrial buildings that were, that were just sitting, sitting there. And our retail corridors, many of our central business districts, retail corridors throughout the five boroughs needed some real attention. 2002, New York is now the competition from London, Singapore, Hong Kong, and so many other cities is greater. Greater competition, tougher times, and New York is trying to rebound. Now it gets better. And you start thinking about New York, and you start thinking about that spirit of New York. And what did we need to do to attract more people, more visitors, more jobs? And I got to say, New York has a tremendously proud history of rallying when times have been the bleakest, we saw it during the subway strikes. We saw it during blackouts. We saw it during the fiscal crisis. And I pulled up this front page that many, many people, well, some people in this room recognize. This is during the toughest times in New York. It's hard to believe when you look at that skyline out the window that this was a city that was going to go bankrupt in, in the, in the mid-'70s. Bankrupt. And the president at the time said, we're not going to help you. We're not going to help you. The gentleman walking across vacant land in the South Bronx is President Jimmy Carter. And he could walk for blocks and blocks. This is what it was like. But some way, somehow, New York ends up bouncing back. And I love this quote. I just love this quote about New York bouncing back. Was it those three home runs that Reggie Jackson hit? Was it Andy Warhol? Was it something else? I would say the, the writer here is right. It was the entrepreneurship that, that, that pushed New York and made New York a much greater place. And, I, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. And it began right after 9-11 again, where aided by people from around the world, New Yorkers looked at the recovery as a challenge. And coming back after 9-11 to the city, I felt that sense of urgency to rebuild and lay the groundwork for the years ahead. And we had leadership. This is a picture um, 
from the mayor's bullpen. This is exactly how he worked, in a bullpen with his close staff right at City Hall. Mike Bloomberg provided a bold vision of leadership, and we were fortunate to have a, a mayor who prized innovation and leading from the front. He was determined to bring government and, and having government play a very proactive role in the recovery of New York and to spur economic development. I watched him as he quickly met with business leaders from all over the city, from all over the world, bringing them in and having a discipline about customer service. You return that phone call quickly, fast, and you do the follow-up. And for someone who served with many other commissioners, he empowered his commissioners, one, to work together, and two, to challenge ourselves and others to be bit bigger and better. It was okay to make a mistake. Go try. Look at the best practices. He encouraged us to think hard strategically. What was our competitive strengths? This is something government leaders don't like to talk about, but what were our weaknesses? And what were we going to do about that? What were we going to do to make things happen? We knew, knew that we needed to diversify the economy. You know the old saying, when Wall Street sneezes, everyone catches a cold. Our economy was so heavily dependent upon Wall Street and the financial sector. Fire, right? the financial institutions, insurance, and real estate. The president of NYU at, at one of our economic development uh, retreats that we would have with the mayor suggested that we look at something rather than fire ice. And that was the intellectual strength of the city, the cultural facilities, and those anchor institutions, and yes, education and combine those together, we can make something powerful happen in New York City. Yes, the focus still needed to be on financial, that was an anchor, but let's see what we could end up doing with many of these startup companies. And in addition to the New York spirit, we were gonna have something else. Anyone know what this is? Well, you can see it's Brooklyn Army Terminal on the, on the bottom there, right? Once the largest military base in the United States, Right? Many of those, these, this is where ammunition was built, put on a train, and sent out. It's about 100 acres, the Brooklyn Army Terminal. 100 acres. Can you imagine what you could do with 100 acres here? Right? It's, it's buildings like this that sat empty, empty for decades. And now being used for small businesses, startups, biotech companies, and starting to turn it around. We ended up putting together industrial business zones to help manufacturing companies. But for the most part, and I talk about that weaknesses again, we ended up giving up on that ghost that manufacturing companies were going to be coming back to New York. At its heyday, let's say the 50s, there were over a million people in manufacturing and industrial jobs in New York. A million people, active waterfront, a lot of factories. Today, that number is under 200,000. And yet, the land use policy in New York City was still zoned for manufacturing, which meant that residential development and mixed use development Hotels in Long Island City could not be built. And no one challenged it. Mike Bloomberg did. And when you look at the early views of, of the Bloomberg administration, it's sort of interesting now to look at it years later. I can recall companies saying that if you don't give me an incentive to stay, I'm packing up and leaving because there's a lot of other cities that want me. And we made a decision back then, the mayor made the decision back then, quite frankly. He led from the front and said, look, 
it would be an easy political win. But if you're going to go, go. An incentive-based economic development strategy in the short run works, sets a terrible precedent. And we knew that, and quite frankly, many of those companies knew the competitive advantage of New York, and they stayed put. We also knew, when we start talking about the strategy of New York City in recovery, that we had to do a lot more, a lot more, in the other boroughs outside of Manhattan, particularly along our retail corridors, which I was responsible for much of the growth of business improvement districts outside of Manhattan, and appealing to a different type of tenant. Those tech companies, those startup companies, and this is where we started. And this was part of our strategy. This was the key to the strategy for the Bloomberg administration. Many cities want to skip that first one, improving the quality of life to attract and retain employers and employees. This is making the cities safer, cleaner, right? Adding attractions. People often want to jump and, and tell you about how great that city is. I remember going out to, um, I'll, I'll just say it out loud, Cincinnati. And they, sh they were showing me their cultural district. It was two blocks long. Don't advertise something that you don't have, right? If it's not there. And our focus was we're going to make sure that the city is going to remain safe and clean and better before we move to some of the others. And I think one of the great things about the economic development strategy during the Bloomberg years was creating an environment that gave businesses the tools to be competitive and create jobs. We created business solution centers in the five boroughs to help businesses get capital access. We also led some economic and transformative projects, which I will talk about more in my presentation in just a couple of minutes. And an important one that a lot of politicians have a difficulty is investing in the future. Investing in those projects that they may not see during their years, but are so important. And we're paying for that by not having invested in our subways, in our bridges, in our water mains, and other infrastructure. That aging infrastructure catches up on you. Now let me give you a couple of examples. Of, of tactics that we use to carry out these goals. Ah, oh, the old High Line. I thought this was a crazy idea. Think about it, right? An old rail line in what was an old manufacturing industrial district. At the top of our list, we were looking at places like this west side of Manhattan, where we could end up doing something creative and doing something special. How many people have been to the High Line? Right? Who has not been to the High Line? All right? Uh, before you graduate from Stevens, you get on that train, get over there, and, and visit it. It is a remarkable place. But the key piece on this was that the High Line is a good example, and I'll show you a picture from today. But the key piece of this, and what I want to emphasize, is that we had to change our land use policy in many places so we could end up bringing about change. And you can see what happened. You change the land use, you give an incentive, and you see a lot of development that has taken place along that 1.4 miles, right? Five million visitors. It's interesting. I have, I have visitors that come into New York. I was like, you know, wh what do you want to go see? And often is, I want to go see the High Line. What's special about the High Line? I just want to see it. It's a vertical park. It's something that, that's different. And it's amazing how many cities now, right, are copying this, right? You, you hear about them, right? Uh, the old rail lines of we could do something special like the High Line, only in New York. And the billions of dollars that have been injected around restaurants, residential, hotels, 
This has become, in many ways, like a string of pearls that has, has been a, a, a powerful impact on development that has taken place. And, and, and some great, great, great uh, views of, of the city and an abandoned rail line. Here's another one for you. That's just south of the Brooklyn Bridge. Okay, that's an old picture, but even back in 2000, back in 2000, these were abandoned warehouses that the Port Authority controlled. Uh, no one's going to touch them. What, what is the Port Authority going to do with it? No, no, you know, we're not sure. The mayor ends up putting a vision together to build a park, and a park along the waterfront that this city had not seen in decades. And if you've gone to, by today, yeah, it's, it's nice, right? It's pretty. It looks great. And it's very active and animated. And you can see some of the things that take place. And whether it's movies, whether people are kayaking, whether they're playing ball, uh, this is a place that tens of thousands of people enjoy. And the impact that that has and how it's been leveraged, it's similar to what we see going on here in Hoboken, that the, that the waterfront has been animated and the powerful impact it has on the entire neighborhood. The New York City waterfront, for the most part, has now been animated and activated. 500 miles of waterfront development that we're talking about. And one of the places that we see it, we see it in places like Long Island City. Long Island City was a dormant industrial area for the longest time. Now you're seeing an art scene, residential, hotels, hospitality, families are growing up in the area. It's pretty remarkable. Another place you see it is in downtown Brooklyn. And downtown Brooklyn has grown dramatically. Grown dramatically. And you see, you see the growth that has taken place um, in downtown Brooklyn. Tens of thousands of jobs, colleges, universities that have opened up along uh, downtown Brooklyn. And here are some of the numbers that, that I wanted to share with you uh, from downtown Brooklyn. Look at a vacancy rate now, right? Under 3%. 10,000 new jobs, 500 new businesses since 2000 in the downtown Brooklyn area. 60,000 college students, NYU Poly, St. Francis, LIU, Pratt, CUNY, uh, the, the, the technical college. It, it's pretty powerful what's happened and that has been branded. And they have an organization called the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership that shepherds that and brings people together. They also branded themselves as a tech triangle for the small businesses in that area to, to come together. And it is really pretty remarkable. I've, I've given you some websites where you can see some of the information that provides you a lot more information on, on, on downtown Brooklyn. I tell, I, another special thing that has taken place is we branded New York City as a college town. Here's some of the numbers when you start thinking about New York, when it, you start putting it all together. Over 660,000 students and faculty in New York, right? The mayor often would say, we have more students in New York than Boston has people, which is so true. And we needed to do something more and much more powerful in leveraging the strengths of the colleges and universities in New York. So we went to work. What could we do? What more could we do? And one of the things was taking this little piece of land, not so little piece of land, on the south part of Roosevelt Island, sitting out there in the East River, right? And doing something about it. And the mayor ended up challenging engineering schools from all over the country to participate in the applied science competition. Educational institutions from around the world will give the land 
we'll put up a little bit of money as a seed investment, and we like to see the best proposals. We got seven applications from 17 universities. Stanford, Columbia, NYU, Carnegie Mellon, you can name them, right? And the winner was Cornell and Technion. They teamed up with Technion Israel Institute of Technology. They built a new campus, two million square feet of space. I think it's over a $2 billion investment that's taken place. The local schools, Columbia, NYU saying, wait a minute, what's going on here? Well, you're interested in growing? Yeah, we're interested in growing. What do you got? Well, NYU ended up putting something up where I always call this the ugliest building in America. It was the old transit authority building that is now being transformed on J Street in downtown Brooklyn. It's gaining a new look, but the most important thing is the powerful impact that NYU is going to have in downtown Brooklyn and on growth of startup companies. I showed you those numbers, right, of those, of those small businesses. Now you're starting adding incubators and challenging companies to be a lot better. It's pretty powerful on, on what's going to happen. Look at the size of that building. Columbia did the same thing on the west side of Manhattan, north of 125th Street, and I think it's just a little south of 125th Street too. A block south, but, it, but, but that has grown. And 17 acres, $6.3 billion in local investment that has taken place. Putting, again, a spotlight on applied sciences. Why is this important? Because this is where we are going to be incubating small businesses. Just like what I saw at the Venture Center today, where, where I met a number of entrepreneurs who want to grow their company. They want, to, they, they want to put a stake in the ground. This is what's happening at these campuses. And that's the powerful impact that's taking place in New York now. And others have replicated at other universities. Let's shift gears for a second. Let's talk about the media sector. New York is one of, without a doubt, the most iconic photogenic backdrops in the world, right? But when Mike Bloomberg took a look at the list of films in New York, many of them were shot elsewhere. But they were using New York as a backdrop. They're being shot up in Toronto, for goodness sake. Well, that changed with relentless effort. That's probably an understatement. And. Uh, with the creation of the Made New York program, spending on movies increased 70%. Television production grew by 82%. I got numbers from 2015 today. I was looking for the 2016 numbers. I couldn't find them. 52 television shows, 336 movies filmed in the Big Apple. And then you got the documentaries and the commercials and all the other things that took place. But this is what has taken place. Silver Cup Studios, a great example of readaptive use of an old building. We know what that was, right? Silver Cup, it was an old bakery, right? Now turned into one of the you know, best film places that we have in New York. 23 shooting stages. And now they're expanding to the Bronx. A great, great, great example. Another one is Kaufman Studios. Kaufman Studios is in Queens, and they're growing. And I was out at uh, Kaufman a couple of weeks ago, and one of the executives was telling me that between 200 and 400 people work on an average TV series. Think about it, right? Okay, the writers, costume, set designers, location scouts, production assistants, carpenters, electricians. It's a pretty powerful impact. And you could understand why, why we wanted to grow that. Not just 
the exposure to New York and putting New York in a good light, but the amount of jobs and the impact that it would have on some of these neighborhoods. We're here talking about incubators. We're here talking about startups. And one of the uh, conversations that we were having uh, earlier today was, so what is it? What is it, what did it take to encourage and support the growth of startups? And I would say it was a very active role of the mayor. Uh, that's where the message began. And I would, I would encourage people who are interested in this issue is to look at the wide variety of the incubators, startups, and that co-working spaces that now exist in New York. And one of the places you can look at it is the website is nycedc.com. And there's over two dozen um, uh, incubators in New York. And uh, the numbers that I, that I took a look at to get updated on this is uh, there's over 1,000 startup businesses and over 1,500 employers who have benefited from city-supported incubators. Government needs to take a role, whether it's on a state level, whether it's on a city level. Universities, colleges can't do it alone. Um, that support has to come from government. And we, we, we saw the example um, in New York, and we, we, we see it. And you can see it in places like Hot Bread Kitchen up in East Harlem, where people are being trained. Many of these are immigrant women who need a, they, they, they're great culinary artists, but they need a sp space to spread out so they could end up catering and, and perhaps you know, start their own company and get some of that additional support, whether it's coaching, mentoring, financial assistant, to make it. And it's, it's a pretty remarkable uh, incubator that they have developed. And one of the key things along the way was we revamped our workforce development program. Our workforce program in New York City was anemic at best. And the mayor revamped the program, opened new job centers across the city. The system when we took it over was placing only 500 people a year. When we left, it was over 25,000. Most of the hiring at the Barclays Center, 1,600 employers. We looked at all the zip codes, surrounding zip codes of the neighborhoods, and we zoomed in on those areas. And we worked with Barclays to hire from the community and make that link quickly. We did it on large scale like Barclays, but also with many of the small businesses. Using government, using workforce development initiatives to also attract companies. A company would come in, we would say, we're gonna make it easier for you to do business in the city. And that had a powerful impact. Let me move on to something I know a little bit about. Before going into government, as was been mentioned, I ran a business improvement district. I ran um, the Union Square Business Improvement District in New York City. We have seen Times Square, Union Square, Many neighborhoods throughout New York City get that extra shine. Why? These public-private partnerships. If you go to Times Square today, you see people sweeping up the streets. Or Grand Central, where they're adding an extra polish. It's not only these added services. And when you add these services together, it's over $100 million in services that have taken place. Jersey City has one of these programs. Hoboken does also. But these are, these are, this is a special way of not only bringing people together, but adding a service. And you can see some of the attention to detail for neighborhoods. It has a powerful, powerful Im impact on commercial revitalization. I, I threw this picture in just to show that this mayor you know, also rolled up his sleeves and got out there and swept the streets on a daily basis. Okay, he was there for the, for the opening. Uh, this was on Fordham Road. And it was important to encourage these organizations to, and challenge them 
to look at open space public plazas and do something special. I took this picture because I, I thought this was one of these crazy ideas of they're going to put a public plaza in the middle of traffic between Fifth and Broadway. This is never going to work. People are not, not going to sit out in the middle of what was traffic. Well, I was wrong. And, but the key thing was to encourage the neighborhood to do something to slow down New York a little bit and to animate the streets and energize a place and, and the powerful impact that it had um, in, in, in our city. To come to a close, as the city grows, I think one of the key things that you look at, and the mayor uh, summarized, uh, particularly after Hurricane Sandy, we had a number of challenges ahead. We were going to get bigger. We knew that. The projections for population in New York by 2030 said a million more people. A million more people. It's hard to believe. Right, right now it's 8.5 million people and growing in New York. As I mentioned already and emphasized, infrastructure was getting older and had not been cared for in a long time. And with growing and aging infrastructure, environmental concerns get even bigger and you have precarious limits. So this is where the plan, YC plan uh, came together, putting fo forward 127 initiatives for housing, for parks, brownfields, energy, air quality, across the board. We got to start on that, but there's certainly much more to do for many administrations, whether it's the de Blasio administration or, or administrations after that. The point is that government has to look long term, not just at the short term picture, but at long term projects. And I end on this quote, that government can work, that the uh, comeback after 9-11 demonstrated that. But it takes a vision, it takes leadership, it takes inspiration, it takes partnerships uh, that are going to work. Fearless vision and leaders, facts, analysis, and great people organized, inspired, and unleashed to work together to help improve lives. That's the timeless recipe for taking big leaps forward. That was from our former deputy mayor, and it's so true. But I think the point I wanted to make in talking about the economic development strategy of the Bloomberg years was that leadership that took place. And now let's end on a fun uh, slide. With the new additions at Yankee Stadium, I'm predicting another world championship for next year. Thank you very much for having me, and I'll take some questions. So I, I don't know if it's a question. It's more of a comment. But uh, you know what? It, it appears to me that, I'm, and I was in New York City when Bloomberg was mayor and all that. And uh, I think what we liked most about it was that he made decisions that didn't try to get him elected to the next office. And I think that's where government tends to go wrong. They, what you said makes a lot of sense. You've got to think long term. And there's just such a tendency for government to look for quick wins because they want to say, I did that, so they can get to the next office. So. How, you know, you, you can't always put billionaires in office, so how do you get politicians or public servants to understand that they need to think long term yeah. and that it might not see the result during their tenure? I, I think that is the, the uh, it's, a, it's a tough question, it's a good question, and it's, it's one that we see not only on a local level, but on, an, on also a national level. Everyone's looking, you know, how, how, do, how do I get reelected? How do I stay in office? You know, and, and, and I can remember going into the mayor. It was an issue that we had, I, I, I want to say it had to do with the Rockaways. And um, it was after Hurricane Sandy on recovery. And I said to him, 
something to the effect that this wouldn't be good politically. And did I get dressed down? <laughs> you know, this is a guy who just didn't care on that. He wanted to do what was right, um, as evidenced by the smoking ban. Yeah. Right? Smoking. We were the, we were the first. I was still angry that you know I, I went into my local watering hole in Union Square and the, the owner threw me out because he was looking short term. The people would never come back. They're, nev they're never going to tolerate this thing. But it was the right thing to do in terms of people's health. The bartenders behind the bars, people you know, uh, you know, sucking in the fumes. Now we go in. And we we can't stand it. Or, or we hear, we smell a whiff of a cigarette in a bar. It was like, you know, put that out, right? But that short-term thing, this is why we are struggling in New York. This is why the conditions of the subways are the way they are. Keep milking it out, milking it out, taking the funds out, resources, right? And never looking towards a longer-term picture. It's amazing to me. You look at small cities or large cities of how many people, how many of them have plans What's the plan? And, is, and do they have a true assessment of, of their competitive edge and their strengths and what some of the threats and some of the weaknesses are of, of, of many of these places? Mike Bloomberg, with an engineering degree and an MBA, constantly challenged us. What is the plan for the next year, two years, three years? And as, as I showed you, is what are we going to leave generations later on? You know, he, he is trying to do that now on a, on a national level. Up at Harvard, he has a leadership program for mayors. Uh, let's hope that we have more public officials that have a backbone who will courageously take some of those steps. As a student, uh, when it comes to a startup or some company which we want to establish, uh, how does government can help or the New York City uh, government can help us? And there are two ways, like either to go to the VCs for the funding or is there some support which can be given by the government for students like us? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what we did in New York City. We, we created something called, and, and look it up, Business Solution Centers. And I, what I found in go, going in, um, in January of 2002, in building the agency, Small Business Services, that there was a real void. And quite frankly, when you started thinking about startups and small businesses, the only time that startups and small businesses would come if there was a problem. So what could we end up doing to help? So we, we created solution centers. We did not have it run by government employers. Right? We had outside um, uh, vendors, private sector, some nonprofit, a mix of them. We gave a variety of different contracts out so no one had you know, a hold on it. And we said one of the biggest issues, and what, um, this is stuff that we heard from many small businesses when we sat them down, is here's how you could help me and, and, and quite frankly, for the most part, get out of our way. Most of them said it politely. Some people, you know, were not so polite. They were pretty direct about it. And they said, it is difficult to do business with government. It's difficult to set up. If you can help us navigate, navigate means getting permits in place. If you could end up sequencing, you know, Con Edison, and your health department, and your landmarks department, and your consumer affairs, and all the other fire department in opening up a place, that would be tremendous. And we made some headway on that. If you could help us identify good workers, and we ended up blowing up what was the Department of Employment and putting it in an economic development agency, and we ran that. And the third was capital access. Right? The ma many of the entrepreneurs that I dealt with were being turned down by traditional banks. Right? 
Banks did not want to deal with them, particularly if you're a restaurant. Forget about it. You're on the D list, right? So these are, these are the ways that we could end up helping uh, a, a startup or a small, a small business you know, directly. The indirect way of, was us playing a very active role in putting together incubators, fashion and tech and food and, and um, arts and media and having cheaper places for people to do business. But the, but the key thing is to convene them and see where we could end up helping. I, I was just checking with a deputy commissioner today. I, I said, how did you do on capital access last year? I want to do something on my radio show on it. And they, they, they had connected small businesses to over $50 million in small loans. Okay, that's pretty good. But the key thing was to make those, those, those connections and having government playing a very proactive role in that. That, quite frankly, is not the way many, unfortunately, governments you know, work. And quite frankly, one, one of the difficulties for me was getting startups, entrepreneurs, to believe that we can end up helping them. I have a question. First of all, I was uh, always a great admirer of uh, Mayor Bloomberg and uh, recognized his great leadership. Uh, but it's great to see the strategies and the thinking that went behind all the successes. So I really enjoyed your talk. My question is a little bit out of left field. Given all your tremendous experience, if you made, had to make the decision for Amazon on where to put their next headquarters, where would that be? Well, it would be in New York, of, of course, right? <laughs> Um, it's a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting about uh, Amazon. What were, they, what were they looking for? They, they were looking for transportation access. That's number one. They were looking for a good workforce. They were looking for, um, and I guess they still are, a, a, a affiliations with colleges and universities. And I think, you know, the, the New York metro area is, you know, who, who beats that, right, um, in that? And they're looking for, you know, a place that has a culture, a, a, a workforce culture. And, and New York, you know, is a special place like that. Now, wh where would I put it if, if, you know, if I was the mayor? Um, I would look at Sunset Park. Industry City has 16,000 square feet of space, just, just what they have now. Battery. Uh, the, the Brooklyn Army Terminal along that waterfront is, is stuff that has been empty since we lost many of those manufacturing industrial jobs. That, that would be probably be my you know, number one place. Uh, you'd have to improve transportation, but the colleges and universities are certainly there. Um, the other possibility uh, is the South Bronx and the powerful impact that that would have. Um, but I, I think that Amazon is going to make a decision, this is my opinion, is they're gonna make a decision based on that point I made about incentive-based economic development. I think that there's going to be cities that are gonna roll over and throw a lot of money at Amazon. And I, and I think that's unfortunate in many ways. Um, there was one city in Georgia that put a proposal into Amazon, and they said, not only are we gonna have incentives for you to come here, now why do, why do you need, you know, it, it's, we, are, we will change the name of our city. <laughs> It'll be the city of Amazon. You know, so, so there's, there's, I think there's gonna be cities that, um, that uh, throw the kitchen sink in terms of incentives, and, and, and New York, um, will will not be be in that game. Um, my my bets, uh, boy, I don't know. Austin, Denver. Um, I'm sort of rooting for Philadelphia if they if they get in the running, but I, I just don't I, I don't see it coming to New York. Uh, so what's your position uh, about sharing economies? They are thriving more and more and wiping out traditional rental markets. So is it something positive for a city like New York or? 
Uh, G- give me an example of what, what you're talking about on sharing uh, I mean economy, Airbnb, so everybody else. Uh, yeah, a- a- Airbnb, Uber, and services that uh, non-professional people do that kind of services. Uh, so for a hotel and uh, other uh, to, uh, mm, industries in tourism, uh, uh, sharing economy is something negative for them because they are replacing uh, traditional rental markets. So for a city like New York, maybe in near future, is it, it, it is good for uh, people, but uh, for uh, all in the industries, it's not something good. So do you have any plan for supporting sharing economies or supporting? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, sort of, it's sort of interesting what sharing economies is. Sharing economies is, is a result of a void taking place, right? Uh, why did why did Uber grow? Uber did it better, faster, uh, with greater customer service than the yellow cab, or than car service, right? And the impact, unfortunately, has had on you know many small businesses that had medallions that they paid tens of thousands of dollars for, over a hundred thousand dollars for you know. Someone, when someone got a medallion when I was growing up, that was you know that, that was like having a piece of the rock. Right? It's like owning your home, right? I got a, I got a medallion, right? That has changed. Why did it change? Technology, certainly, right? You, you, you know, my, my son goes to baseball practice. He comes home on an, on an Uber. How, how does it, you know, they, they go, he's, he's a poly prep. They, they pick him up, they drop him off. He's, you know, it's, it's easy, it's convenient. And um, it really disrupted. It disrupted a economy. It, ju- it disrupted a lot of people's lives. But I think long term, it makes it makes everyone a lot better. I mean, that's 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 my that's my opinion on that. And I, th- I think that w- I think we're going to see more of that. I think the one that you know when you start talking about disruptions in economy the one that i'm watching quite a bit is retail quarters and those small businesses up and down whether it's right here on washington right um people have changed their shopping habits dramatically you know we're we're we're, we're shopping my my wife did most of her christmas shopping I'm, i'm i'm sorry to say this from our kitchen table, right? Or from the couch while she was watching CNN, right? Who suffers? A lot of these small businesses along the retail, it's not my wife's fault, it's, it's millions of other people too, you know? But, but that has ch- you know, changed dramatically and that's going to have a powerful impact on a lot of those retail you know, businesses, to the point, I think, that rents are going to have to come down. They're going to have to come down. Or, or, or property owners are going to have to look at the, the, uh, how they're marketing businesses. That, that day when someone came in and plunked a lot of money, boy, boy that, that, that has changed quite a, quite a bit. We, we're, t- we're seeing double-digit vacancies in a lot of those retail corridors. And I don't think anyone has an answer for that yet. Um, you know, now government officials will end up saying, well, let's do commercial rent control. Is that the answer? I'm not sure that's the answer. Well, thank you very much for all of you coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. And I, um, I'm looking forward to getting to know some of you um, right after this. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah. Rob? Rob, thank you for coming out on this cold night I loved and it. coming from a distance. Yeah. We really appreciate it and very much enjoyed your presentation. Mm-hmm. And here's just a little token of our appreciation. Oh, look at this. I love this. That's great. <laughs> Th- thank you all. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. This is really great. Thank you.